Hello everyone, welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, April 9th. Today's topic is making makers. A drill press is a girl's best friend, a boy's too. Your show hosts are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffat, Tammy Moore, thanks to Tammy for doing the closed captioning, and Paula Noggle. Our special guest today is Coco Khalil. And I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy, who will introduce Coco. Well, hello to all of you, and welcome. Today, I am thrilled to welcome Coco Khalil as our special guest presenter. And I know you're going to leave so excited and inspired after you have heard from her. If you're a regular participant in our Classroom 2.0 Live webinars, you know that I love participating in webinars and vir virtual conferences. And when I go, I'm always looking for amazing presenters that I can invite to join us in our webinars so all of you can meet and learn from them. Coco is one of these awesome presenters, and I was so inspired when I saw her on the Student Technology Conference in January that I knew we had to have her on our show. Coco is an eighth grader from California, and she sees her role as supporting and inspiring technology novices and enthusiasts, and she does that through her website. You will learn all about her many passions on her website, including, just to mention a few, 3D printing, coding, design software, and even drones. She wants to encourage her peers to make technology and not just consume it. Her site includes kit reviews and making tips, and she tries to simplify the process for her audience to make it more accessible. So you will see that right away, not only on her website, but in her presentation today. She also had the honor to co-write the foreword to a recently published book called The New Shop Class, Getting Started with 3D Printing, Arduino, wearable tech from A-Press Publishing, and she's been a panelist on topics such as Arduino Grassroots Revolution and Women in STEM and the 3D Printer World Expo. And she gave a talk on girls and robots at the Texas Linux Festival. Maybe you say that Linux. I, I've heard it both ways. And. Uh, Make Magazine published a blog about Coco and one of, her, one of her mentors entitled Soldering a Connection, the start of a mentoring relationship, which was then translated into Japanese. So Coco is also extremely well-rounded, and she enjoys fencing, field hockey, her school 3D printing, robotics, math, and Latin, she plays the oboe, and she even helps puppy raise for Guide Dogs of America. Coco, we're so happy to have you here with us today. And we always like to start our presentations with a newbie question that will give our participants new to your topic a little background. So our question for you today is, why do you think it's important to encourage young people to be makers and not just consumers? So take it away, Coco. Thank you, Ms. George. So uh, the newbie question, as you just mentioned, is why is it important to encourage young people to be makers and not just consumers? So my response to that is that we're really great at buying technology, right? But making has so many rewards for students. Um, some of these rewards are developing problem-solving skills, like fixing things that you've made or um, uh, finding problems to work on, um, collaboration, such as in robotics teams, overcoming obstacles, like when something you've made doesn't work, and being able to get over that, and that's coupled with tenacity, um, and creativity, hands-on learning, of course. Um, time management, I've also um, found, is a really great along with making. And I just find it really satisfying to make things. Like, you can say, I made this cool thing, and um, I'm proud of it. So that is my response to the newbie question. 
So uh, I'm going to advance and begin my presentation. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, uh, good morning from California. Good afternoon to everybody around the world. Um, thank you to Peggy George and the Classroom 2.2.0 live team for inviting me to participate today. So, I'm Coco Khalil. I'm in the eighth grade at Harbor West Lake School in Los Angeles, uh, California, in the United States. I have a website called VeryHappyRobot.com that I started when I was 11. I often suggest technology projects, do tutorials, and give technology kit reviews or tips. Sometimes I even troubleshoot on projects when things go epically wrong. Projects that appear on my website range in difficulty from uh, easy blinky light kits, which are often used by scouts to earn their soldering badge, all the way up to making a tricopter from scratch. When I do reviews, I award very happy robots on a scale of one to five very happy robots. I base the number of very happy robots on metrics like easy to follow instructions and overall quality of the kit. If the kit isn't something that I think is worthy of my followers, I won't even post a review about it. I hope that my website helps to inspire future innovators, tech enthusiasts, and makers by making technology accessible, exciting, and fun. Sometimes I post about government regulations, like the FAA's recent call to register drones, or really cool scientific discoveries. But mostly, VeryHappyRobot.com is about making. I'm extremely honored today to present my topic titled, Making Makers, a Drill Press is a Girl's Best Friend. My passion and enthusiasm for technology and making certainly didn't start with a drill press. But today, I will devote a great deal of my discussion to this lovely, life-changing, fantastic, and infinitely important piece of equipment. You might call me the ultimate fame girl of the drill press. If you have even the slightest interest in technology or making, a drill press truly can be a girl's and a boy's best friend. So can a lathe, a 3D printer, a laser cutter, and a miter saw. In my talk today, I will demystify some of these tools. Yes, you too can learn to use them. I did, and if I can, you can. I will discuss the importance of all of these tools to current day makers and my enthusiasm for securing access to these tools for all students around the world. Yes, an ambitious ideal, but absolutely necessary. We are making makers, and makers need tools and machines. And most importantly, we need teachers and mentors to teach students how to use the tools and machines. My dad and I recently restored a 1956 Craftsman Model 100 drill press in our garage. Later on, I will discuss why restoring and fixing is important to me as a maker and why it might be important to you too. I will identify projects that need a drill press and why every girl and boy should know how to use one. There, I said it again. Every kid should know how to use a drill press. There are some of you out there today who might not know what a drill press does or even what it is. That's totally okay, but it's also a bit sad to those of us in the making world. When starting with a drill press, make sure to have an instructor or an expert to show you how to operate a drill press in person, and please wear safety eyewear. So, let's start with the most important thing of all, safety. Safety and health always come first. A few years ago, before I taught a soldering class, I wanted to make a point to novices, so I created a sophisticated and glamorous Audrey Hepburn inspired photo shoot to show the class I was about to teach that I was serious about safety. I'll show you my slideshow so that you understand what safety procedures need to be followed no matter whether you are soldering or using a drill press. You can find this slideshow under safety and soldering on veryhappyrobot.com.
If technology, STEM or STEAM, is truly the future of our world economies, then using a drill press, a bandsaw, a lathe, a soldering iron, 3D printers, programming, milling, and much more will be needed skills for all of us. And as a side note to all of you educators joining this conversation, it's not too early to start teaching your students. I started using much of this equipment as a fifth grader. At the very end of my talk, I'll tell you about my current projects using all of the machinery that I believe middle school and high school students around the globe should be teaching their students, especially those interested in robotics, computers, or any kind of technology. As you may have guessed by now, I'm an activist for making technology and not just consuming it. As students, most of us love gaming, texting, Snapchat, and Skyping. But I'm advocating that we should be creating our own projects and technology right alongside those that we buy and use in our everyday life, or adapting existing technology to create our own needs, or understanding how to fix our own technology. By the end of this talk today, I hope that you're inspired to advocate for yourself and your schools, classmates and teammates, to return machines and making to the classroom, which was commonplace just a generation ago. Luckily, some schools and communities are creating STEAM rooms, maker spaces or hacker spaces, and reintroducing machines on their campuses. Some schools are incorporating making into their daily curriculum. And for that, we can be grateful, and we applaud it and encourage it. Kids can and should learn how to use all of these tools safely with appropriate supervision. More than that, kids will need to know how to use all of these machines if they're to become the engineers, scientists, inventors, and innovators of tomorrow. There's a reason that a small garage located at 367 Addison Avenue in Palo Alto, California, is a celebrated museum and a destination for technology nerds like me, one that I visited on my last spring break. The world has been changed because of tinkerers doing projects in their garages. And if you look at photos of the contents of that particular garage that is now a private museum and considered the birthplace of Hewlett Packard and the Silicon Valley, you'll see prominently displayed none other than a drill press. That's right, a drill press in the heart of the tech industry's ground zero. And just like the one in my garage, Bill Hewlett and David Packard bought their Sears Craftsman drill press used. Besides an overview of tools and the almighty drill press, later in my talk I'll discuss a list of projects great for novices, then intermediate makers, and finally more advanced makers. Since we're talking about making makers, I'll tell you about my journey of becoming one and where you might go with it. Legos, Minecraft, Tinker Toys? I will then elaborate on basic skills that I believe every student should have, like soldering, programming, exposure to Arduino and Raspberry Pi, 3D printing, and even web design, and how to get started with any of those. I will also list some great resources for you to explore. I'll then make some great recommendations for tools, projects, camps, websites, books, magazines, robotic teams, conferences, and even drones. A complete recipe from making makers. Finally, I will bring all those schools, skills, tools, and machines together when I discuss my current project, which is a low temperature differential Sterling engine that I hope to complete in time for my middle school science fair in May. Years ago, my dad and I had bought a used drill press for the garage. As I've become more interested in technology and making, we realized that it needed some serious tender loving care. It was making a clunking sound, the knobs didn't turn easily, and it needed a good cleaning. As a maker and someone who cares deeply about our environment, I had recently taken the pledge on ifixit.org. So helping out our drill press rather than just replacing it with a new one became even more important to me. Here's the pledge. I will learn to fix things that I didn't think I could, I will buy things that are built to last. I will fight for our right to repair, and I will share what I learn along the way. 
Well, this pledge describes everything about the used drill press in our garage. You might think that restoring a 60-year-old craftsman drill press is very difficult, and that a girl in the 8th grade and her inexperienced dad have no business taking on a project like that. But when you talk to most professional engineers, you'll discover that as kids, they often took things apart and then put them back together or created something else with the parts. It's a natural starting place together. We should not be intimidated by taking apart or fixing just because it isn't part of our culture anymore. In fact, it's something that we need to develop and foster. When my brother's laptop started to lag, I took it apart and upgraded his RAM and hard drive. All the instructions were easy to follow, uh, were easy to find on the internet. And I mean, how hard is that? You can see the time lapse on my website. I'm a huge advocate of taking things apart and fixing them. If you haven't done this, I highly recommend the process. Even if it's something that you might not fix to work again, take a broken appliance or an outdated phone and open it up to see how it works or what the parts look like. That ties into the advantage of fixing a drill press or taking it apart to refresh it. When you take something apart, you gain an intimate understanding of the machine when you break it down into pieces, clean it, fix it, paint it, and then put it back together again. While I did this with our 1956 drill press, I also applied the same principles to assembling a 3D printer from a kit. Not only was the 3D printer far less expensive in kit form, but since I knew that 3D printing is often frustrating and challenging, knowing that I assembled all the pieces myself made it far less intimidating. When things go wrong, I can often troubleshoot or make necessary adjustments. 3D printing technology still has a long way to go, but when you understand your machine, you can make your work just that much more successfully for you just like a drill press. I do have to mention that having the mindset to fix things can really be handy around the house. A few years ago, our dishwasher broke. We didn't want to wait for a repair person to come, so we took off the panel and went online to do some research. Many makers have posted instructions online that it only makes sense to start there. Because I knew how to solder, I ended up repairing our dishwasher with a $1 chip we got at our local electronics store. The dishwasher was fixed before the repair person could even be scheduled. And we probably saved a few hundred dollars on the house call. Unlike fixing a burned out chip on a dishwasher, the repair and rebuild on the drill press and how to do that took a much longer time. And some of the replacement parts required a little more extensive searches. Almost every night for the last several months, after I finished my homework and practiced my oboe, my dad and I went out to the garage for a few minutes each night. We took everything apart. We took apart the motor. We fixed the motor. We cleaned the parts. We replaced the bearings. We sanded it. We primed it. We painted it. We replaced the on off switch. We put it all back together. And then it turned on. It worked. And now it's as good as new. The point of a drill press is to drill a hole in a precise location at a precise angle and depth. Lately, I've been using a drill press to drill very precise holes in metal on parts of our robot for my middle school's robotics team for the FTC competition. We tried using a handheld drill, but it was very inaccurate and very difficult. We really didn't have the arm strength to make hand drill drills go through the metal pieces. Having access to a drill press not only helped put the holes in the right spot, but it also saved us valuable time over using a regular handheld drill. One of the most useful functions of a drill press is that you can determine the depth of the hole you cut. Let's say you want to drill halfway through a piece of wood. You can set the drill press to do that, and you could do that over and over accurately, which is almost impossible with a handheld drill. When making my tricopter drone, I needed very precise holes, and they needed to match exactly on each arm of the drone. Everything needed to be in proper balance to fly. I was able to drill accurately because of the drill press. 
I also discovered that fixing a drill press wasn't that hard. I know it sounds crazy, but it's true. Looking at it at first, we were intimidated to take it on, but we first did our research and found schematics for the whole drill press that showed how each part went together. Many thanks to VintageMachinery.org. Then, we found a website on which someone had pulled apart and rebuilt the same exact drill press that we had. Again, many thanks to GarageJournal.com. And to contributor J.T. Van Valrico for his excellent thread. We broke the task down into easy steps that we could accomplish in just a few minutes or in half hour increments each night. It's like the difference between studying for a test a little bit each night versus trying to cram it all in the night before. Taking the time, or really making the time, to do it in baby steps taught me that all projects are really like this. So often it's just about starting and staying on a path, and before you know it, you've accomplished something. I've started advocating for access to this kind of machinery for students in the classroom at several conferences I've been lucky enough to take part of. I spoke about this topic at Los Con when I sat on a panel titled Women in STEM and Arduino, Grassroots Revolution. I spoke with, a con with conference attendees at a poster presentation at the 3D Printer World Expo. Then I spoke about girls and robots at the Texas Linux Fest. And at the Design and Maker Class Colloquium in Los Angeles this past August when I did a warm up to the keynote. I also recently gave a keynote at the 2016 Student Technology Conference. Every time I've spoken at an event, I have shown my project and what a kid can do if given access to all of these wonderful tools and machines. So many of those in attendance spoke to me about using tools when they were a kid and how important that was to their technological journey and even to influencing their current careers in engineering or technology. I also spoke about the importance of learning to solder and the importance of having mentors to teach us for Make Magazine's blog titled, Solder a Connection, the Start of a Mentoring Relationship. Teachers and mentors, please know how important you are to students like me. Make's blog was then translated to Japanese for Make Japan. The importance of mentoring and soldering went around the world. Soldering seems very intimidating at first, but it's really easy once you start and practice a little. I've taught high school students, community college students, middle school students, and even teachers how to solder over the last several years, starting when I was in, in the fifth grade. The thinking was that if I, an elementary or middle school student at the time, could not only solder, but could teach others that then I could inspire them to solder or teach others too. It starts with each of us to make makers, first ourselves and then others. I first learned to solder in 2012 at a meetup of the Los Angeles Robotics Club that now includes more than uh, 2,800 members. I learned to solder alongside other members of the club in a class taught by the founder of the group, a roboticist named Annika. I didn't know at the time that this was the first time that she had ever taught a soldering class and that it would be so helpful to me. I still remember the first time I ever soldered. I soldered the first version of the Adafruit Arduino Uno Proto Shield. So how do you ultimately learn to use a drill press, a laser cutter, a miter saw, or a CNC mill? In my case, I started small. I was the kid who loved Legos and Tinker Toys. Then I begged for Lego Mindstorms NXT. I put them together and took them apart. Then I wanted more. If you have an interest but don't know where to start, here are some recommendations. If you are a novice maker or if you want to help inspire other makers with technology, I'll outline some suggestions for beginners, intermediate, and advanced makers. I learned to solder when I was 10 at the Los Angeles Robotics Club meeting that I spoke of earlier. I actually believe that I probably could have learned to solder even earlier, which is something for educators and parents to decide for their budding makers. Do you have the maturity and dexterity to learn to solder in the third grade, the fourth? 
I learned in the fifth, and I truly wish I had started earlier. I have friends that started when they were in the second grade. I first ordered Blinky Light Kits. These kits are very inexpensive, and there's instant gratification to know if your joints are successful when the lights blink at the end of your project. These kits can be easily purchased at your local electronics store, like Radio Shack or Adafruit.com. I want to repeat again about safety. I make sure to always have plenty of ventilation, safety glasses on, hair in a ponytail, and I always wash my hands after I solder as a precaution. There are organizations that most people don't instantly think about, like the American Library Association that embraces teaching technologies, especially to teens. A few years ago, during Teen Tech Week, the Central Library in downtown Los Angeles decided to host a soldering class. I had met one of the librarians at the hackerspace I belonged to. She asked me, a fifth grader at the time, if I'd be willing to teach the soldering class to high school and community college students who come to the library as part of their teen program. We ended up having a little hurdle to resolve with the fire marshal at the Los Angeles Central Library. So we moved the class into the library courtyard, away from the highly flammable book stack. I taught the high school and community college students to solder using similar blinky light kits to that I had practiced on. We met in two sessions. My librarian friend, Candace, told me that one of the girls in the class later decided to pursue engineering because she realized how much fun soldering was. She had been intimidated to even try, but by making it accessible to her in a non-traditional setting with others who were also novices, she discovered skills that she never knew she had. When I taught a class of teachers at the Design and Maker Class Colloquium in Los Angeles in August, which was my best group of soldering students ever, I must admit, some of the teachers screamed with excitement when they connected their blinky light kits to the battery and it lit up, indicating that all of their soldering joints were successful. Some of the teachers tweeted about their success and knew they would go back to their classrooms teaching, uh, to teach their students how to solder. They discovered that soldering was not as difficult as they imagined and hands-on learning had really helped them. Please encourage your schools, your students, or your classmates to learn to solder. If you don't know how to solder yourself and you're interested in technology or making, you should make it a point to immediately learn to solder. You might find yourself fixing your dishwasher or even connecting a joint on the circuit board so that you can fly a drone. I got to hang out with Sylvia when we were both presenting at a technology conference in Los Angeles. Sylvia has got some great beginner projects on her website and in her books meant for beginners. I highly recommend Super Awesome Sylvia for her detailed instructions. Sylvia travels the world as an advocate for student makers. Along the way, I joined a hackerspace. Some also call themselves makerspaces, but they're similar. Especially in urban areas, many tech enthusiasts have secured locations for their membership and fill them with very expensive machines. Usually, for a small monthly fee, you can join these hackerspaces and use their equipment so that you don't have to invest in it yourself or find a place to store it. After all, most garages are only so big. Some of the hackerspaces even have classes to teach you how to use these machines. One of the best things about a hackerspace for me is the access I have to professionals and enthusiasts who know how to use this kind of machinery and who will share it uh, who will share some of the projects they have done. At the hackerspace that I belong to in Los Angeles, one of my favorite machines is the laser cutter. I was 11 when I first learned to operate this awesome piece of machinery. I most recently used it to cut out parts for my tricopter and for my stirling engine. When I did the suggestion box, I downloaded the school's logo and crest using Inkscape, a vector-based graphics software. It's free and it's good. It has a robust open source community. I then etched the logo onto a piece of wood. I designed the entire box with the software and laser cut, the entire thing in my hackerspace. I was really proud of that project. Once you become a maker, the sky is literally the limit. I became fascinated by drones and quad toppers before they became much more affordable and easily purchased. 
My parents, again, insisted that if I wanted to have a drone, that I should build it from a kit. I met Simon Nielsen, who has a company that specializes in drones, called Controlly Robotics Lab in Venice, California. Simon's company designs drones for all purposes, but they specialize in drones for the movie business and oil exploration. Though they no longer have a hackerspace at that Venice office, I was fortunate enough to learn to build a drone from a kit at their company, Controlly. Not only did I assemble the drone, but it also required a bit of soldering. Again, I'm encouraging everyone to learn to solder. I built a DJI F330 Elegant quadcopter kit. After quite a bit of assembling time, I actually got my drone to fly. Control Me often sponsors obstacle courses for the drone enthusiast to practice flying. Using my first person view, I can maneuver around obstacles. Of course, some crashes do occur in the early moments of learning to fly, making all of your skills, like soldering and using tools, a necessity to repair your drones. I also suggest some more advanced projects for makers, but I'd like to emphasize that age should not be a determining factor. I assembled the 3D printer kit when I was 11, and I made a tricopter from scratch when I was 13. As the technology has advanced and the prices have come down, 3D printers are much more accessible. However, a few years ago when I was begging for a 3D printer, my parents agreed that I could have one if I assembled it from a kit. Here are the photographs from my experience building a 3D printer from the kit. The pieces, the assembly, the assembly process, and the kit fully assembled. For any of you who have learned to 3D print, you have probably discovered that sometimes the head gets clogged or that the filament catches, or the temperature isn't right. By knowing how to take apart and reassemble a 3D printer, it makes troubleshooting that much more simple. I'm lucky to live in Los Angeles, where there's so much technology surrounding us. The 3D printer kit that I assembled came from Pasadena, and an entrepreneur named Diego, a deez maker. Pasadena is home to NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and Caltech, so I have been blessed to interact with some of the top engineers and scientists in the world through the process of meetups in Pasadena. Control Me in Venice, California introduced me to drone technology where I met cinematographers and artists from the film industry. The members of the Los Angeles Robotics Club included leading engineers from the aerospace industry. I think that these kinds of amazing people are found all over. I think that they can be found more and more at hackerspaces and meetups. I've mentioned hackerspaces and makerspaces again and again, and I cannot encourage them enough. Most of the members of the spaces are willing to share their expertise and knowledge with you. I encourage both students and teachers to learn the equipment. Many of them, just like you, had no exposure when they were young. I say to students to have patience with your teachers, and they'll come through for you. I'm a huge fan of the open source community, and I'm in awe of how many enthusiasts post tutorials and projects online and share their process. I have learned many things by simply watching online. I'm a huge fan of Jimmy DeResta, and I watch his videos all the time. I also believe that you don't need to reinvent the wheel. One of the most critical steps in making makers is research. Before I start any project, I research who has done that before me. If it's not exact, is it anywhere close to what I want to do, and can I learn from them? Are there manuals online for some of this old equipment, like our 60-year-old drill press? And there usually are. Here are some questions to consider when starting a project. Has anyone out there tried to fix one of these? What's the vocabulary that I need to learn? What are the techniques that I need to know about? Is there a community of enthusiasts or bloggers out there? When my dad and I were embarking on our drill press restoration, we found a great resource with garagejournal.com. We were inspired and comforted by someone else's posts. Are there open source communities like Linux for programmers or Thingiverse for 3D printing? Yes, or most likely. 
Please remember that research is a creative endeavor that requires patience and tenacity in problem solving. We all know that Google sometimes doesn't give us what we want on the first try. Maybe one of you or your students will be the next innovator to refine that tool. I consider myself more of a hardware enthusiast than a software enthusiast. But I still feel that programming is an important skill for every maker to have. Whether it's Scratch, or Python, or Java, it's important for makers to have an understanding of coding. There are great books about Python programming. Codeacademy.com is a great place to start to learn to code. Girlswhocode.com has clubs and summer immersion programs to get girls started. I loved the class that I took a few summers ago through Digital Media Academy on Java programming for Minecraft modding. If a computer programming course is, avail is available to you, please sign up for it and consider it just like you would another world language. It will be a helpful communication tool. For those of you just getting started, or for those of you who want inexpensive microprocessors, I highly recommend both Arduino and Raspberry Pi. When I was 10, I attended a lecture in my hackerspace given by Rob Bishop, who is one of the first full-time employees of Raspberry Pi. He's known as the Tech's Justin Bieber. No, I unfortunately didn't get his autograph. It was probably way past my bedtime on a school night, but my dad knew how important it was for me to learn about the things I was craving at the time, open source and new technology. Raspberry Pi has brought technology to schools and kids. It's a really important part of making tech accessible to all, and I encourage you all to check it out. I've already shown you how I assembled the kit to my Bukubot Vanilla V2 3D printer from Bees Maker in Pasadena. But there are many more aspects of 3D printing that are great for makers. My friends Rich Cameron and Joan Horvath recently published a book called 3D Printing with Matter Control, Streamlining the 3D Printing Process with Open Source Software. And I'd also recommend Joan Horvath's other book, Mastering 3D Printing. Both are great resources to explain 3D printing and how to get started. I do caution you that 3D printing still has many kinks to work out. So just like with the online research, patience and tenacity are truly virtues when learning with this tool. I love to scroll through open source projects posted on Thingiverse and Imagine. I have posted a few myself under a very happy robot. I'd like to use SolidWorks designing software to create my 3D printing projects. There's a student discount when you buy the program, but SketchUp's also great. There are many fun decorative things that can be made by 3D printing. I've made, them, I've made my mom a few really cool gear bracelets. There are also practical applications that I've made to solve a problem. When I first attached a camera to my drone and controlled me, I noticed that the angle was off by about 8 degrees. I mentioned it to Simon Nielsen, the owner and he challenged me to fix the problem. I learned SolidWorks, and I designed a mount for the camera. I 3D printed one for myself, and I gave several to control me. I also uploaded the camera mount designs to Umagine, and I've had over a 1,000 downloads between the two mounts. I also created some parts for my tricopter last summer using my 3D printer. Once you have the ability to imagine and then print out something like your own part, you really feel like a maker. I had the honor to co-write the foreword to the recently published book, The New Shop Class, Getting Started with 3D Printing, Arduino, and Wearable Tech, from iPress Publishing. This is a great resource covering many of the areas of interest I have discussed today. I also recommend having experts teach you to use a bandsaw, a ripsaw, a lathe, a grinder, or a buffer a table saw, and a miter saw. You won't have any limits to your technological creativity when you have no fear of using tools and machines. I also recommend camps that I've attached for finding your people, including the Sally Ride Engineering Camp for Girls, the Digital Media Academy, John Hopkins University's CPY, 
Hopefully, most of you can also consider school or local robotics teams like First or Vex. Whether meeting attendees or pres presenters, another great way to connect with other makers and learn volumes is through national or regional conferences like the 3D Printer World Expo, Linux Fest, such as the Texas Linux Fest, or the Southern California Linux Fest called Scale, Design and Maker Class Colloquium, Maker Fairs throughout the world, such as in the Bay Area, Rome, China, India, the International Drone Expo. I love to get inspiration from anywhere I can find it. Some of my favorite publications include Popular Mechanics, Popular Science, Make Magazine. In fact, my project last summer was completely inspired by an article I read in Make Magazine. After reading about Lucas Weekly's Tricopter in Make Magazine, I really wanted to make one for myself. I already had a few drones, but Tricopters are known to have more stability in flying. Lucas Weekly sells a kit with the nuts and bolts in the frame, but I wanted to do it myself from scratch. If you go to VeryHappyRobot.com, you can see a list of all the parts needed. I must say that after doing a comparison of materials, his kit was ultimately less expensive than mine, as some of the materials required a purchase in bulk or a larger quantity than I needed. Three stages for the Tricopter project, acquisition, assembling, and upkeep slash troubleshooting. You can see that I could not have done this project without access and the knowledge of these machines like the saws and drill press that I've been discussing today. I had to order parts online and also go to local hardware stores to find everything. I assembled all the parts, painted, sanded, and as with anything that flies, rarely does it work perfectly the first time. I kept crashing my tricopter, and I was so frustrated that I wanted to cry. I had to turn to some online research and discovered that my yaw was backwards. A simple fix, but a huge one. Once my yaw was in the right direction, I was finally flying. I am currently embarking on another project, a low temperature differential Stirling engine. I will hopefully be able to complete it in time for my middle school science fair in May. There are many books about this available, and even Bill Nye the Science Guy has a segment about this engine. My Sterling engine will run with the warmth of your hand for external combustion. I completed the bill of materials, and I assessed what we have on hand and what we need to purchase. I'm definitely using the following skills, machines, and tools to make this science project. The Sterling engine will need the drill press, the lathe, the table saw, the saber saw, cap and dies for threading, the soldering iron, programming the Arduino, a horizontal cutoff saw, bench grinder and the polishing wheel, um, the laser cutter. I even made a tool called the uh, nichrome hot wire foam cutter. Actually, I made two of them. Um, I may also need to 3D print a part or two. I also might need to make a milling attachment for our lathe. I'll keep you posted. It's not exactly the CNC that I've been hinting at, but it'll do the job. And I'll keep you posted on the Sterling Engine progress on VeryHappyRobot.com. I know that I have covered a lot of technological ground today, but I hope that you can see that you too are completely capable of learning how to use a drill press and everything else I've discussed today to help you become a maker, an innovator, a scientist, an engineer, a technology teacher, and more. I want to remind you to always follow safety procedures and to have training before you touch any tool or machine. As a maker, a drill press is a girl's and a boy's best friend because it allows you to do so many things in robotics, making, and innovation but mostly it's the start of a beautiful relationship with tools and machines that at first may be intimidating, but in the end will bring you great joy. I'm Coco Khalil. I hope to connect with you on VeryHappyRobot.com about your current projects. Thank you for listening and happy making.
if any of you have questions, I'm happy to answer them now. Thanks so much, Coco. I so, did capture some questions. Let's start with, okay. have you and your dad ventured to make any drill press jigs yet? Uh, I guess adding no. on to the drill press, okay? We've actually not made any drill press jigs. We have, um, for the lathe, made some jigs with mm -hmm. the drill press. Okay. Um, we made um, uh, something called a lathe dog, which um, allows you to connect a piece um, and center it. Mm -hmm. um, but if anyone has any suggestions on jigs to make, I did see one made by um, a YouTuber named Clickspring Online. If mm -hmm. anyone um, is aware of that research uh, resource, but I love any book suggestions or um, videos uh, to make. So, great question. Yeah, this this person says there are lots of of print book resources for jigs in most libraries. Oh, um, okay. Any book suggestions? I, I don't know if Craig is still in the room. I don't know if he has any suggestions. He asked the question, so maybe okay. we'll see, see something in the chat. Uh, okay. Do you ever do or teach solder art, like statues, pendants, or other things like that? Um, I don't. Mm -hmm. I am much more of a technical person. I am not the artist that uh, I, yeah, I'm not much of an artist, but I do know my grandma actually, um, she knows silver slaughtering and I've seen mm -hmm. her make jewelry with it and I do know people that have made jewelry, but I have not personally okay. done any of that. That's okay. Um, have you ever done Skype calls or Google Hangouts with other classes to have conversations about making and, and your other passions? Yeah, I um I had a friend that I met at a conference and she was teaching um a class to kids about technology and I did Skype in um mm -hmm. and talk about my involvement in technology a few years ago. Or okay. maybe no, it might, might have been like two years ago, I'm not sure. And how do you recommend teachers bring making into the classroom? Um, well, with I, I really think that the greatest way to bring um, very simple um, technology into the classroom is um, teaching your kids how to solder, um, mm -hmm. just basic blinky like like basic kits um, such as the ones I talked about on my website or I've talked about today. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a very satisfying process once you get the lights to blink and mm -hmm. it's not actually extremely difficult and there's many tutorials online on how to solder and mm -hmm. I'm sure you could find someone um, outside of the classroom to come in maybe and teach. Sure. Sure. Well those were the questions that I was able to capture as you were presenting Coco. Now Peggy did ask the, the room if anyone wants to uh, ask Coco a question on the mic that you can please raise your hand to do that asking. Mm -hmm. oh, there's one. There's one uh, okay. source for a drill press jig at oh. woodworkersjournal.com. Cool. Okay, so I'm seeing uh, a question. That is, Coco, what are your own career aspirations? Mm -hmm. That was next. Um, well, right now I am in I am in eighth grade, mm -hmm. so uh, I actually have done something with this. I plan on being an engineer. Um, I plan, like, I don't know, probably to go to college for that, but um, uh, I can't say definitely. I just somewhere in the engineering field, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, so, Peggy, uh, I already asked that question about bringing making into the classroom. Okay, so those were the questions, and I will now turn the show over to Peggy, who will introduce what's coming up next. And again, thanks so much, Coco. Thank you. 
That was so inspiring, Coco. I know people are going to want to spend some time browsing through your site and all of the fabulous links that you've shared with us today. I know that if they were to share this recording and your site with all of their students, they would have some very inspired um, students who would want to have some of the same experiences you've shared with us today. So thank you. We do want to remind everyone we won't have a show next weekend because that is the Discovery Education Spring Virtual Conference. And the following week on April 23rd, we have a great presenter coming to talk to us about educational branding for both for teachers and schools. And that is Desiree Alexander. On April 30th, Mike Gorman is going to join us to talk about project-based learning in STEM. May 7th, Todd Nesloni and Adam Welcome are going to come and share all about the Kids Deserve It initiative. If you're not part of that, you're going to want to learn more about it and get involved. And on May 14th, we have another featured teacher, and Nate Balcom, who was the originator of the March M Book Madness uh, program and many other student projects, is going to join us and share those with us. So I hope that you'll all plan to come back every Saturday you can and join us. And this is the information about the Spring Virtual Conference, and I'll drop that link in the chat. And it's also in our live binder. I know that's going to be a terrific day. So Lori, go ahead and take All right, Peggy. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's latest. He's gathered all his PD resources in one place, including host your own webinar. So you can sign up for a Blackboard Collaborate room for an event, and as long as the event is public, the session is free. You can nominate a featured teacher, like we'll have a featured teacher coming up soon, by filling the form that's located here or in the Live Binder in the Resources area. And also in the Live Binder is the survey for Classroom 2.0 Live. Uh, the link is, will also be in the chat box. When you take the survey, you can request a professional development cert certificate, uh, include your name at the bottom of the survey, and a personal email address. School email clients tend to block these from getting to you. The recordings are available at iTunes U in both a video and audio collection as well as an RSS feed and the full recordings on the Classroom 2.0 Live website. Special thanks again to Coco Khalil, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in the show today. Thanks so much for coming. <laughs>